on, this is key, sorry. Well, good morning and welcome. Let me just explain why I haven't been here for all those who are worried about me. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not in a bad way. I'm okay. Uh, we just had cheerleading. Cheerleading with Alyssiana for the past, I don't know, for a while. Um, don't like it, hate it. Uh, but I didn't want to take the opportunity away from her either. So, uh, But I'm back, uh, and it's good to be back. Um, so with that said, it's good to see you all today. Um, we have a little bit of change in uh, the person who's giving our message. Poor Craig is uh, down. He is sick. So let's keep him in our prayers as we uh, go forward through this week. Good morning, everyone. I hope everyone's been feeling good this morning. The call to worship this morning is Psalm 25, verses 1 through 9, and it's a responsive reading. So I'm going to read to you the first stanza, and the second will be a song. Come, lift up your heart to the Lord. sinners back to his way and teaches the humble the way they should go. Show us the right path, O Lord. Point out the way for us to follow. Lead us as your sheep and teach us for you are the God who saves us before our whole family. So please Turn to your song book from 501. We will sing the first section and outline the third and sing the fourth. Savior of mankind, slave of sin 
reign. Give me holy courage, mighty, mighty king. The fourth verse. In the same vein of people not being as listed on the program, I'm not Ellen. <laughs> but I did hear from Ellen this morning, and Craig is doing a little better today. Um, his fever has broken, and he was able to rest some, and hopefully he'll get good rest today as well. Um, so we will keep them in our prayers and know that they want to be here more than where they want to be, where they are. Yeah. I can't read the prayer request. <laughs> because that's really tiny print over there. But if there's anybody not on the list that you would... Still can't read it. It's too far away. <laughs> Thank you, though. Um, if there's anybody that you would like to add to it, we'll make sure that happens. Frida. Gary Oni in surgery today. Oh, two hours ago. Oh, someone needs to fix the clock. I saw another hand out of the corner of my eye. Was it you? Was it you, Sue? Herman? Carl Schaefer. Carl Schaefer is at the ER. Okay. Oh, has been admitted to the hospital. You're welcome. Any praises that we can add to the prayer board? Yes, Mrs. Schell. And has moved to rehab, will be home in the nursing home soon. Right. Okay. Crystal, home from the hospital. Sue. Mm -hmm. God knows. Any others? Then let's go before the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we boldly come before your throne today in prayer with the full knowledge that we do so because of your grace. And we thank you for that. Um, we lift up these requests, and I don't even remember all the names, but you not only know the names, but you know the situations and you know the outcomes. And we uh, put our faith in, the, in that today. We pray for the wheelers as they are away, that it's a time of rest and restoration for them and that they come back fully charged for the busy, busy Christmas season. And uh, we pray for the elections that are coming up this week. And though in many people's minds it's not important because it's not presidential, 
it's more important. Uh, and we pray that as we make choices as voters um, to put people in, in the offices that affect us locally, that uh, we do so in a prayerful manner, we do so in an educated manner, and we do so trusting, again, that you have the outcomes all worked out for us. Uh, we think of Veterans Day this week, and we thank you for our servicemen and women who bravely and boldly go not knowing what's on the other side, and for the families, too, that they leave behind and they don't know either. Uh, we just pray that in our own way, each of us finds a way this week to, uh, to, uh, to just spend time thinking of that and pondering what it means for our lives and praying for those men and women who do so. And uh, we thank you for the opportunities that we'll have this week to serve you, to love others, and to just spread joy. And we pray that we have the courage and faith to do so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As you can see from the back of your bulletin, the, youth, uh, the announcements for the week are Monday, youth music and seniors, senior band. Tuesday will be senior, seniors and then Bible study and women's ministry. Wednesday, prayer focus on the elections as Jane just prayed about. Club 316 and then Friday, core cadets and teens and senior songsters at 7 p.m. And then next Sunday, back here for worship at 945 and then don't, don't forget the upcoming events on November 17th, first day of Kettles. Let's be in prayer for that. Um, we struggle every year because of all the stores that we've lost already uh, due to closings and, and other things that have happened. Um, kettle season is very important for us. That's what helps us sustain our uh, ability to provide for our, our, our community uh, throughout the year. So please, for all those that are gonna be standing kettles, uh, let's keep them in prayer, keep the workers, keep the staff in prayer, and uh, let's just remember that that's what, that's what makes our community what it is. And then on Tuesday, November 21st, uh, family night, side dish or supper.
Good morning. God is good. All the time? Amen to that. We are blessed. Uh, driving up, I saw some of his handiwork with all the scenery, but a lot of the leaves are already off. But every time we walk outside, we can see his handiwork. It's not just within these four walls. Within these four walls, we're in a sanctuary. But once we hit outside, we're in the real world. That's where we become targets for the daggers and everything else in this world that puts Christians down. And as Christians, we need to be responsible and stand up for our faith. It's important. As you took notes on the program, I'm a no-name person. <laughs> but I'm all right with that. I don't need a name, and I'm not dressed to be behind a pulpit. But you see, clothes are your outerwear. What matters is what's in your heart. The clothes, like I said, they, they're just a covering, just like our skins are covering over our bones. And that's what we need to... And when Ruth Ann asked me to sing the song, I said, I don't know it. <laughs> but you know what? Between all of us, we can foul it up. Uh, it's song 505. We're going to sing the first. We'll outline the second, sing the third, outline the fourth, and sing the fifth. That way the band will get a rest. But I don't know what the tune is, so I'll have to listen to Sharon. And then. <laughs> soul to come to thee. But now since thou hast quickened me, I rise from sin, start spiritually. Good morning. As the band goes down, I'm just going to open in a word of prayer that God will calm my spirit, use my mind, my heart, and my mouth this morning to bring what he has given to me uh, to speak on, okay? Just pray with me. 
Father God, we come before you, a humble people, a people ready to hear what you have given to us this morning. Father, I ask that you use me this morning, that you speak through me, that it will be your words that are spoken, not mine. Calm my spirit, Father. Take the distractions away. Take the nerves away. Be my whole mind at this moment. Amen. I'm not going to read the scripture first. I'm going to kind of get into the introduction to the sermon first, if you don't mind. Um, I need a volunteer. Let's see. Hmm. Adriana. She's begging the volunteer. Up here. She's going to stand beside me just for a couple minutes. Do you like to be touched? Some people like it. Some people don't. It's a touchy thing, right? Okay. Me, myself, there are days when I want to be hugged. There are days when I don't care if you put your arm on me and just say I'm praying. And there are days when I just don't want to be bothered. And I think we all get that way, correct? I want everybody to stand up. And I want you to find a partner. It can be someone you don't normally talk to, someone you do normally talk to. And I want you to turn and look at that person. Okay. I want you to reach out your hand to each other and shake hands. Okay. Now, I want you to take your arms and outstretch them just like you would if you were given a hug. Does that make some of you anxious? Does it make some of you anxious? I'm not going to ask you to hug that person unless they want to be hugged. You want to be hugged? Sure. As you come back, you can now be seated. It was just a little experiment on how we like to be touched or don't, okay? Many studies have been done about the devastating effects on infants if they are deprived of human touch. And it's true for adults too, yes? When I was at the training school, many of you know her, Mrs. Colonel Lohman, her mom passed away. We were in half hour power and no one sat with her. No one spoke to her. It was like she was untouchable and she needed that touch. And God said to me, and I love Mrs. Loma. I, she was my core officer when I was having trouble. So I really love her and respect her. So God just said, she needs you to just sit with her. So I went up to her seat during half hour power. If you're at the training school, you would know you don't move. You do not get up out of your seat and switch seats. You were assigned a pew to sit in. Well, I got up and I moved. I was listening to God. I wasn't listening to the rules. And I walked up and she was sitting there and she was crying. And I just took my hand and placed it on her. Didn't say a word. Just sat there with her. When she was finished and didn't need me to hold her hand anymore, she looked at me and said, thank you, you knew just what I needed. And sometimes that's all a human needs. It's a touch. She said, I felt like everybody thought I was untouchable, like I was unclean because my mom had died. But that's far from the truth. And so many times we back out and we become afraid of that. We all long to be touched at some point in our lives. And today we're going to look at 
the story of two touches and the power they made to the whole community. And we're going to dive into our scripture first. And the main characters are Jesus and two women. One was actually still considered a child in our community. Okay? And we're going to read together, or I will read and you can follow, whichever you prefer. Mark chapter 5, looking at verses 21. And I'm going to expand where Craig had wanted to go. And I'm going to go all the way to the end of the chapter, which is verse 43. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him. My, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet, instead of getting better, she got worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up. She came, when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd. Pretty hard to do when there's a giant crowd and you're trying to get to one person, huh? And touched his cloak. Because she thought if she touched his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she fell. She felt it in her body. She was free from her suffering. Once again, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched me? The people said, you see all these people crowding against you? His disciples replied, and you asked who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your, your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue leader, don't be, don't, don't be afraid, just believe. Key word, believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why are you all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father, mother, the three disciples who were with him, and went in where the child was. He took her hands and said to her, Talitha Kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and walked around. This little girl was only 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. God bless this word this morning. First, let's look at Jesus. 
Jesus is a rock star. Can you see it? Can you see it? Everywhere Jesus went, he always had a large crowd following him. Have you noticed that? Any time he's in scripture and he's going somewhere, there's always a large crowd. Imagine taking Dr. Phil, Oprah Winfrey, the Beatles, Billy Graham, and for the younger ones, Taylor Swift. Mashing them all together and multiplying it by 100. That's the kind of fame that Jesus had the first half of his ministry. I kind of describe Jesus' ministry from what I read, that at first it's like a roller coaster, going up, going up, everybody loves him, everybody wants him, everybody's wanting to see and hear him. And then all of a sudden, whoop, it comes down because he loses his popularity at the climax of the transfiguration. Then after that event, Jesus starts heading to Jerusalem and his teaching becomes very intense and the people turn to him or turn on him. This is my illustration of the Gospel of Mark. You can see that the crowds are a mob of fans in the first half of the story. But then they turn into a lynch mob in the second half. Today, we're just going to talk about the, popula the popularity side. There are three reasons that Jesus was very popular. I call them the three Ps of his popularity. They are preaching, power, and parables. The people loved his preaching because he taught with authority. He boldly proclaimed this message that we will come back to, to, to again and again. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Jesus taught with parables. He told stories that invited people who had ears to hear. He told the good soil to lean in and explore and explore the deep mysteries of the kingdom they did. Jesus mesmerized people with his teaching. Combine that with somebody who can heal the sick and restore tortured souls. And you've got a superstar. And that superstar is Jesus Christ. So today, we finally get to look at some scenes where Jesus demonstrates this amazing power in Mark 5, 21 through 43, which we just, I just read, we see that Jesus heals two women in the story. It is the story of two touches. One woman is a 12-year-old girl with a life-threatening fever. The other is a woman and has a 12-year-old disease. Here's the, story. Here's the story. Let's look at the girl first. I'm going to read it again, Mark 5, 21 through 24, which says, When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him. While he was by the lake, then one of the synagogue leaders, excuse me, synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed. So Jesus went. This isn't just the story of any little girl. This is the story of Jairus' daughter. He is the leader of a synagogue. He's a big, he's a big deal in town. He's in charge of the worship. He's in charge of the schooling. And here his daughter is sick. This means that his daughter is probably a big deal too. If this were downtown Abbey, 
she would be like Lady Mary. On a bigger scale, she would be like the president's daughter. She's 12 years old. To be 12 in ancient Jewish villages, she would be equivalent to being about 17 to 20 years old in our culture. She is just about to become an adult woman in society. Think about this for a moment. Imagine if the president's daughter developed a life-threatening disease. What do you think the president's going to do? I'm sure that he's going to go to the ends of the earth to find the best doctor he can to help her. If you, or you, or you, were the doctor that the president chose and asked to come and help his daughter, how would you react? For me, I think I'd probably reschedule all my appointments and fly to D.C., especially if they offered me a ride on the Air Force One. That's kind of what's going on here in verse 21 to 24. Jarius is the big man in town. He's so worried about his daughter that he walks up to Jesus in the midst of a huge crowd and falls at the foot of Jesus and actually begs Jesus to come and heal her from her fever. For Jarius to do this and bow down before Jesus was a sign or perhaps a daring act of respect and worship on his part. Here you have a very popular girl. She's Jarius's daughter. She's probably the belle of the ball. Everybody knows her. Everyone worries, is worried about her. She's the center of the crowd's attention. And Jesus starts walking to the house. And a large crowd follows him and presses him on. Then, if you look at verses 25 and 26, something happens. The scripture says, And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet still, instead of getting better, she got worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch him, or his clothing, I will be healed. She had hemorrhaged for 12 years. Can, Can you imagine? imagine? 12 years of bleeding. I don't know about you, but that seems an awful lot. She seemed to have an incurable condition and was considered unclean. Jewish people followed the law of Moses very carefully the law states that when a woman is in her menstrual cycle, excuse me, men, she is unclean. An unclean person must remove herself from the population and live in isolation until she becomes clean again. In the case of a normal cycle, this was designed to protect the woman, to keep her husband away from her during this unpleasant time and to give her time alone. She would go live in the red tent while she waited her cycle to pass. And then she would do a purification ceremony and be good to go until the next month. Imagine if your cycle never stopped for 12 years. That would drive me insane. I don't know about you, but it would drive me insane. This woman had been in the red tent of isolation for 12 years. 
No one had touched her for 12 years. How would you feel if you were in isolation and not touched for 12 years? I personally would feel very miserable. I would feel very hurt. I would feel untouchable. And I would feel unclean and not want it. That no one cared about me because they, they didn't have enough courage to come and touch me or to talk to me. Today we have people in the world that are like that. And I'm sure you can name some along with me. We have the homeless. We have people in our congregation who don't say a whole lot. That doesn't mean they're not unclean or not touchable. They just may be shy and backward. And we've all been where sometimes we don't talk or, or get involved with people. They could be a widow or a widower or someone that's just mourning and needs a hand to hold get them through a couple days. Two relational therapists discovered that there is a huge amount of no touching in our society. Picture a widow at our church. There's a lady sitting right here. She's a widow. Can you see her? Okay. She's a widow. And after church, she receives a huge hug from her pastor. People were like, why did you hug her? What, what was that about? But you know what? That may have been the only hug she had all week. And she's desperate for that touch. She's desperate to be hugged or have her hand held or her shoulder, hand put on her shoulder just to say, I'm here and I'm, I'm ready to listen or to pray with you or for you whenever needed. In Mark 27 through 34, it says this. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I touch his cloak, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized the power had gone out of him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see all these people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, Who touched me? Jesus knew. Jesus knew. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. And then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said, my daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed of your suffering. This woman was hematrine, yet she mustered up enough courage, pushes through the crowd, and touches the hem of his garment. And what does Jesus do? He stops in the middle of a swarming crowd of people and says, who touched me? He looks around and he sees this woman. He sees the longing, the desperation, and the courage it took for her to do what she did. He stoops down, touches her, and says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Sometimes we ourselves, I know me, Feel like our problems will keep us from God. But he's always there with us, ready and willing. He's waiting on us. We should never be afraid, never fearful, to stop, never allow fear to stop us from coming to God. Just then, as we would continue to read, a messenger comes from Jairus' house. Jesus took too long. The girl is dead. And that's found in chapter 5, 35 to 43. 
where it says while Jesus was still speaking some men came from the house to Jairus the synagogue leader your daughter is dead they said why bother the teacher anymore ignoring what they said Jesus told the synagogue leader don't be afraid just believe and that's for us to do too today if we're afraid of something afraid of a touch afraid to talk to someone afraid of something that's going on in our life don't be afraid just believe he did not let anyone follow him except for James and John the brother of James and Peter when they came to the home of the synagogue leader Jesus saw a commotion, a commotion. In, in the back days in Jewish culture, it was the thing where they cried out. It wasn't just because the daughter died. It was because that was tradition, that they had to cry out and make loud noises over this little girl because she had passed away. So Jesus said, why all the commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. And they laughed at him. But after he went in with Peter, James, and John, and the mom and the dad, he said to the little girl, Talitha Kum, little girl, I say to you, get up. And she did. She did. All he did was touch her hand. And she got up. Let's look at the two stories for just a moment. In both cases, these were forbidden, forbidden touches. The law of Moses clearly stated that if a person touches a red tent woman or a dead body, then that person would become unclean. The uncleanness is the power agent. It pushes us away. It makes us back up. Because we think that person's unclean or that item is unclean. But when Jesus touches the, th the unclean thing or the person, the power is reversed and they're no longer unclean. This is the power of Jesus' touch to make that which the law declares as unclean to be clean. One of the other observations I see in this scripture, notice what was to happen to these two women in order to be made clean. The woman who has been on the margins with the hemorrhaging and sleeping in a tent and not allowed to be near anybody had to come to the center of the community in order to receive the touch of God and to be made clean. All the people that she touched as she was pushing her way through to get that to that cloak have now been tainted with her uncleanness. But she got there and she touched his garment and was made clean. Which meant all those people that she had touched getting there weren't unclean. They were clean because she reached out to God. She touched Jesus. Jerry's daughter, on the other hand, who enjoyed the limelight and the privilege of living in the center of the community, had to move outside of the community. She was now in a room in her, in her parents' home, in her home. Nobody could come near her. She had to be placed out where the woman with the hemorrhage was brought in. She had to die. Jesus had to meet her in the darkness of isolation because a dead person in Jewish culture is unclean in that time. Before she could receive his healing touch, she had to be placed in isolation. And his healing touch brought her back to life. 
I don't think these are coincidence or accidental details in the Gospel of Mark. Jesus has come to turn the world upside down. The kingdom of God calls those of us outside of the community to come in to the community. And he calls the elite, the privileged, those that think that they're better than everybody, who are higher than us, to go back, to back out. Do you see that in that scripture? Because I do. Because no one is better than anyone else. We are all able, equal in the sight of God. Our challenge today, we say again and again that we are the body of Christ. Everyone in this room who's a member of this church is peeps in the body of Christ. Okay. We are his hand, his workman, his voice, and he works through us. So today I'm going to ask you a couple questions. And it's between you and God, but answer sincerely. How do you need to be touched by God today? Who needs your touch today? This, is there someone that God places on your heart that needs your touch today? We're going to sing the chorus to the song, He Touched Me. And as we sing, I invite you to come and pray and get that new touch from God that you need for healing, for whatever it is. It doesn't mean it's going to be an immediate healing. It doesn't mean that he's going to take everything away, but he's going to give you the power and the courage to deal with it. Okay? And if there's someone in the room that you feel you need to go to and just put your hand on them and say, look, I'm praying. You've just given them a touch from God. Do that while we sing, okay? He touched me. sing it again feel the joy by allowing Jesus and God to give you that extra touch this morning or give you the strength to go to another person and touch them Let's pray. Father, we receive your touch this morning. Sometimes we're afraid to get up and do, but you put the words in our hearts and in our mouth and in our mind. You tell us what to say to that friend that's hurting. You touch us with a new touch of you if we just 
are bold enough to come to you. And we thank you for that this morning. Amen. If you'll stand with me, and the band will come back up. We're going to sing song 893, Simply Trusting. Actually, it's 892. Simply trusting every day, trusting through a stormy way. We all have storms. And we all need to trust. Even when faith is even when my faith is small, trusting Jesus, that is all. I think we're just gonna sing the first verse in chorus and um the last verse in chorus, please. If you'll join with me in the benediction. Thank you guys.